Hi, my name is Omar al Rawi. Today, I'll be presenting our work, The Circle of Life, a large-scale study of the IoT malware lifecycle. This work is in collaboration with my co-authors, Charles Lever, Kevin Valkyrie, Ryan Court, Kevin Snow, Professor Fabian Munroes, and my advisor, Professor Manos Antonakakis. The Mirai attack was a monumental event that demonstrated the impact of vulnerable IoT devices on the internet. We saw critical infrastructure go offline, ISP customers lose their internet services, and degradation of public cloud infrastructure. But in the aftermath, what have we learned? We saw the first IoT malware back in 2008 with Hydra, but that didn't seem to prepare us for Mirai eight years later. Is IoT malware just like traditional malware, like desktop malware and mobile malware? Should we be on the lookout for new attack techniques that we're not familiar with? Are we, as a security community, prepared for the next Mirai-like attack? Are ISP providers, infected networks, or even critical infrastructure able to withstand and defend against a large-scale Mirai-like attack? So why are these questions important and why are we asking them now? Well, anecdotally, we are seeing an evolution in malware, IoT malware. Specifically, we're seeing new targeting of firewall devices, home routers, TVs, DVRs, and other devices. We're even witnessing an evolution in attacks and their targets. So cyber criminals appear to be improving their malware. If we can monitor this emerging threat, we can be better prepared for the next Mirai-like attack. I do want to point out that we're not the first to study IoT malware in the academic literature. There's been plenty of papers that looked at specific malware families, looked at IoT malware in general to study their characteristics, and even Linux malware, which overlaps with IoT malware. These papers provide a fascinating perspective into this landscape, but they only give us a partial understanding. For example, a lot of the data sets are small, ranging from hundreds of samples to thousands of samples. Or they look at a specific malware family or they look at a specific phase, like the infection phase of the IoT malware lifecycle. Criticizing these limitations is easy, but addressing them is challenging. First, if we look at the original Mirai paper that had 19 different authors who contribute 11 different data sources to reconstruct the Mirai attack. These data sources are not synthetic. They're operational data from nine different commercial companies. Second, there are no large scale data sets for researchers to study IoT malware and most of the data is collected through short-lived honeypots. And as prior work has shown, IoT malware can detect and evade honeypots. Third, as the Understanding Linux Malware paper showed, the tools to analyze Linux malware is limited. So it's even more so for IoT malware because they target multiple architectures like ARM, MIPS, Spark, PowerPC. And so we have to build specialized tooling to handle these differences. Assuming we have the data, and the tools, it's still challenging to study IoT malware because there are so many variants. How do we go about studying their phases, their tactics, and comparing them to traditional mobile and desktop malware? Maybe we can quantify the different phases of the malware's life cycle into a framework like the MITRE ATT&CK framework. The MITRE ATT&CK framework describes different stages of an intrusion attack. Under each stage, the MITRE framework defines malware tactic. For example, under the infection stage, the MITRE Wharton framework defines phishing, drive-by download, and supply chain attacks. However, this framework very much focuses on traditional malware, and many of the classifications don't apply directly to IoT malware. If we step back, we find that the MITRE framework falls into these five broad categories, infection, payload, persistent capabilities, and CNC communication. So to start, we took the five categories and defined a lifecycle framework. We then systematized prior work on traditional malware into this framework. So for example, we use the infection category to derive subcategories from prior literature and see how that applies to IoT malware. The infection categories has six subcategories describing various infection methods. Remember, our initial goal is to understand the threat landscape for IoT malware by comparing it to traditional malware. This comparison grounds our perspective into qualitative and empirical evidence instead of anecdotal, which gives us a better perspective about the threat landscape. The empirical approach, we start by sourcing the data from VirusTotal and enriching it with data from bad packets, active DNS, passive DNS, and Tranco's top list. 
VirusTotal is a commercial threat sharing platform that's used by hundreds of commercial companies and thousands of security researchers that share their experiences, their analysis results, and even their manual investigations. We sourced about 166,000 samples over the period of one year, and we filtered that down to 138,000 samples based on five or more AV detection to avoid false positives. Next, we wanted a way to analyze these different malware samples, so we had to rely on a decade worth of malware analysis techniques and build custom static and dynamic analysis tools to analyze the samples. For example, we built and curated over 200 Yara rules using CVE from public exploit for Linux-based embedded devices. We used a list of popular IoT devices, crawled their CVE entries, and then found proof of code concept for each of these vulnerabilities and built a Yara signature. Additionally, we built a full system and binary emulation platforms for our dynamic analysis. We based this on open source tools like BuildRoot, and in collaboration with ZeroPoint, we, they contributed the binary emulation platform, which we use for this study. From the infection vector analysis, we found that IoT malware has shifted from relying on credential guessing to exploit-based infections. This figure shows the evolution of IoT malware exploit arsenal and how it has grown since Mirai. First, we not only witnessed the growth in terms of number of exploit, but also the categories of devices that IoT malware targets. It has grown from the traditional modem and router devices all the way to industrial control system, web application, and even enterprise appliances like VPN and firewalls. Overall, the IoT malware uses two primary infection tactics, unlike traditional malware. Payload analysis results suggest that the vast majority of IoT malware observed in the wild stems from Mirai's initial source code, unlike traditional malware where there are many independent code bases. This result can suggest that it might be easier to detect IoT malware since they share the same code base. However, we did see IoT malware take advantage of polymorphic techniques like packers. We found at least 3.3% of the studied samples to use packers. This is a lower bound because this is what our tool were able to detect. Overall, we found that IoT malware uses the same payload characteristics as desktop malware. The persistent analysis found that IoT malware must overcome the read-only limitation found on IoT systems. IoT systems use a read-only file system to avoid corrupt state. They pair that with a watchdog process that resets the device when it becomes in a bad state. Resetting the device wipes out temporary memory, which is where IoT malware resides. We saw that IoT malware will use vendor-specific tools to persist on these devices. Additionally, IoT malware will try to remount the file system as writable to prolong the infection. Additionally, we saw that the IoT malware will target watchdog process and kill it to avoid the device from resetting. From the capability analysis, we found many of Mirai's original capabilities intact, including DDoS and spreading. Additionally, we found proxy services and crypto mining services and also device bricking. Overall, we found that IoT malware has different tactics for persistent due to the limitations of file system on an IoT device. However, we found that many of the IoT malware capabilities are similar to PC and desktop malware, but more capable than mobile malware. The malware operator side, we found that infections happen through other infected devices. They scan the internet and they infect vulnerable devices. One key difference, though, is the infrastructure for payload hosting and command and control servers are split. The payload servers favor cl public cloud infrastructure, which get taken down fairly quickly within 10 days. This doesn't affect the botnet itself, it only affects the spreading, since that is the delivery mechanism of the payloads. What is remarkable, though, is the absence of DNS usage. In many of the samples we looked at did not use DNS, they used hard-coded IPs. Only 7% of the samples actually used domains, and most of the domains were used for the payload servers. We tracked this problem down to a bug in Mirai's code, where the buffer that resolves the domain does, is not initialized correctly, which creates a malformed DNS packet. We also observed peer-to-peer -peer communication between different samples, including the Hijami sample and variants like Mozi. We also observed Tor communication, Overall, we found that IoT malware relies on peer-to-peer -peer and centralized communication, 
but does not use email and SMS messaging protocols like traditional malware like desktop and mobile. So is IoT malware any different? Our findings suggest they are different. More specifically, we think IoT malware is in its infancy stage and has the potential to be a bigger threat than traditional malware. For example, an infected IoT device can be a perfect backdoor for attackers since most IoT devices are inconspicuous on the network. In the near future, we can expect more impactful attacks, fast-paced and widespread attacks, and more stealthy and harder to detect attacks. How about our defenses? Are we prepared for another Mirai-like attack? We most certainly do have the technology to deal with IoT malware. However, based on our assessment, IoT malware doesn't seem to be a priority. Recent executive presidential orders that attempt to secure the US infrastructure and improve the security of IoT devices are commendable. Also, there are recent works that attempt to educate IoT consumers with security labels. Nevertheless, IoT malware does not know borders, and it's a global problem. Safety labels might impact the US consumer segment to practice safe IoT purchasing, but they neglect the global aspect of IoT devices. For example, according to the original Mirai and Hajime paper, the US and most of Europe does not even make up the top 10 countries of infected devices. So, in an effort to support this research and future IoT malware studies, we are releasing all of our tools and the dataset to the community. Please take a look at our paper that has much more interesting findings that we describe in detail. Also, check out our data at badthings.info and our companion project, yourthings.info. We plan to combine these two datasets to better understand how vulnerable devices influence the evolution of IoT threats. Thank you for listening today and be happy to answer any questions.